Hello again, dear listener and watcher. This is the start of the show. Welcome to Fine Period Comma Online, a series of pre-recorded videos featuring storytelling and otherwise. And on the show, we are lucky enough to have the wonderful Nathan Hare, Brandy Bird, and Mallory Tater. And throughout the episode, you'll hear music from Teresa, who will also be playing later on. And I will be your host. My name is Cole Nowicki. And if you're wondering how long in self-isolation it took before I shaved my head, it was nine days. It took nine days. All right, that was the monologue. Let's get on with it. Enjoy the show. All right, okay. I feel like you might think I misled you. You probably imagine that we're gonna get right to the performers. But if you've ever been to the live show, then you know that how it usually starts is I share a bit of my own work first. And because I'm selfish and I'm editing this video, that's what's gonna happen right now. I'm gonna read a few poems and then we're gonna get on with it. Thank you for indulging me. And this first poem, is inspired by a story a friend once told me about a, a family member of theirs who had an intestinal worm. And the process they used to get rid of that intestinal worm was that they waited until it was nighttime. And then they shone a flashlight on that family member's bare anus, which then attracted the worm to come towards the light. And once it did, they held out a little stick in front of the worm, the worm grabbed onto the stick and then they twirled and twirled until the worm was gone. And I was unfamiliar with this tactic and it was very inspiring to me. And I wrote a poem about it and this is it. It's called Twirling. Twirling. Working through emotional trauma is like removing a parasitic worm that's found its way into your person. Now eating away at your healthy reserves. Yes, that's the argument I'm trying to make. Please don't leave. Both require patience, continued commitment to healing, therapy, eating and sleeping right, trying, failing, and continuing to attempt maintenance of real human relationships is inchwork, small steps, a worm poking its head from the ass to see the light, get it to grab onto a stick and twirl, slowly, ever so slowly, the same motions done over and over again until it's hopefully all gone. If you go too fast, the worm breaks. Now there is more inside of you, but keep at it, twirling, no matter what. If the worm can see the light, you can too. Okay, quick side note. A number of months ago at the live version of Fine, I read that poem and afterwards someone came up to me to let me know that they had used that twirling technique to remove a worm from their own body. And they said it worked great. And I told them that is fantastic. I am so happy for you. So if anyone out there watching this right now has employed that technique in their own lives, just smash that like button. Okay, this next one is about trying to limit the time that I spend on my phone, which is difficult to do as of late. It's called healthier. Two hours and 36 minutes a day only. I did it, cut my screen time 32% off the top, trimmed a few apps, voila, better now, healthier, mind free to think its own thoughts. Oops, forgot to turn notifications off. What do you mean the military took action, killed a general in active war, I'm at the movies on a date? Sorry, sorry, I'll put it away once the trailers are done. All right, this last one is about a big red paperclip, and it's called Bigger, Better. A blogger from Montreal traded a paperclip for a funny-shaped pen, bartered from there to a doorknob, camping stove, a generator, etc., until a house in Kipling, Saskatchewan, population 1100, was his. The small town buoyed by the attention brought from the trade and sunny wholesome story built a 15 foot two inch tall three ton red paperclip statue 
a world record. Then the blogger wrote an aspirational book, 3.5 stars on Goodreads, extolling the idea that anything is possible to a certain degree. Come on, look at the house, traded again to a restaurant owner, now the Paperclip Cottage Cafe. Pretty sweet, right? Sometimes we need that, the spectacularly benign to counter, well, you know, gestures to the world. For however brief a time, it's able to hold our tensions together. All right, that was those things. Thank you for listening to them. Now, let's get on with the show. Up first, we have a very good and funny human person, Nathan Hare. Uh, hey, everybody, Nathan here. I was clearing out my room and I found my old journal from high school and it's, it's so embarrassing. Um, uh, it was really making me cringe reading through it, but I thought, you know, it's actually, it's really embarrassing, but it's also really funny. So I kind of had this thought that maybe what I would do if you, if, is um, read some of, some of my old journal entries and we can all kind of have a laugh about it in these uncertain times. So, um, yeah, this one, uh, uh, I don't even know what to say, but I guess I'll just start, um, I guess. Uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, please, I beg of you, do not do not judge me. I was 16 when I wrote this, okay? So, oh. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, uh, in these uncertain... Oh, I cannot believe I wrote this. In these uncertain times, McDonald's is here to deliver a familiar, comforting, and delicious experience you can count on, no matter where you are. Even though some of our dining areas may be closed, most McDonald's rest... <laughs> okay, please forgive me. Most McDonald's restaurants are still open and serving our customers through options such as drive through carry-out, and Mc McDelivery. Literally, kill me, this is so embarrassing, but I'll keep going for you, okay. From April 20th, uh, March 24th to, to April 6th, McDelivery through both Uber Eats and DoorDash is offering zero delivery fee for any orders with a minimum $15 baskets. Basket size? What was I talking about? Okay. Learn more about how McDonald's is supporting franchisees, crew, and communities during this time. McDonald's.com. Oh my god, that's so embarrassing. I'm so sorry I suggested you that, but I hope you had a, a, a laugh. Um, no, but for real though, please go to McDonald's.com. Next up is Brandy Bird. They're a Soto and Cree poet from Treaty 1 territory, currently living and learning on Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil land. Her work has been published in Poetry is Dead, Pearls, and Prism, and their debut chapbook, I Am Still Too Much, came out last year with Rahila's Ghost Press. Here's Brandy. everyone at Virtual Fine. I'm Brandy. Hello. Uh, I'm here to read you some poems that are not exactly cheerful, but hopefully will distract you. And that's what we all need right now is some distraction. So I'll just get into it. The first poem is called A Drowning. I wrote it for poetry class. Okay, A Drowning. Imagine the Red River flush with bodies. They're runoff, just bodies all drowned in water or in COPD. My grandma raised me when my mother couldn't. In a tiny shack, particle board stained with nicotine, hands with nails in them like Indian Christ. We prayed to Christ, pictures of him, white and blonde and muscular on the cross above the icebox. Praying to him before I drank from the rain, rain barrels, got worms, needed deworming medication. The rain barrels were navy blue and the water in them was clear but dark as my own eyes. I savored every sip of it. My grandma stirred whiskey in her tea with her pointer finger. She covered the Pyrex glass with a paper towel as if she thought I couldn't tell, as if I'd care. 
I wanted to see myself hanging in her gaze, swimming in her wet, drunk eyes like the river itself. Whiskey current pulled me under, burned the blisters from the tire swinging on my hands, swimming astringent until her arms guided me back, notorious river in my lungs. Coughing, forgetting to cover my mouth, water pours out, floods the whole shack. We all drowned that day. This next one is called Count on His Drunk Mothers, and I can't stop touching my face. It's so itchy all of a sudden. Oh well, I'm at home. Count down his drunk mothers. After Michael Wasson and Dennis Smith. 10. Somewhere winter. A girl tableau of snow angels, halos added later, made of sticks and tinsel from the dumpster. 9. January blue. Girls play for 12 hours because they can't go home. 8. The snow piles where the plows push it, and, snow, and girls slide down hills into the sleeping street. 7. Girls' mothers drunk at 9 a.m. 6. Check day. Nicotine yellow, lasting until the sun sets. 5. Over the, hor the horizon, grab my hand. 4. Cool fingers in the dark, a bottle of Budweiser and a snowball. 3. Drunk mother or child wanting to go home. 2. Low-income townhouses, girls' braids like barbed wire. 1. Girls spitting out baby teeth alone in the snow. Zero, a history, a collapse of beer vendors. This next poem is called Relocation. It's about the relocation of my family from Selkirk to Peguis when Peguis was established, which is my reserve. Relocation, after Lely Long Soldier. Myself, a church I built with blueprints from the Fellowship of Lower Fort Gary. Ended is a name I've given my body. 1907, a concept, a calendar dredge up from the well in the flood of the century. North is displacement, a forced removal, 169 kilometers up the prairie. An organized body, a body on asphalt, of asphalt and gravel roads. Here, there is only the sound of footsteps in the rain. All Indians are rivers. All Indians are rivers, live in the river, die there. Their bodies float to Hudson's Bay and get caught as the river freezes, reanimate, talk dirty to each other. Peguis First Nation, illegal land transfer, molted air from the chimney stack that grows out of Selkirk, Manitoba. Anxiety is summer, is a natural gas thermal pump and a little girl beside it in 2002. She sleeps with a knife under her pillow, a screwdriver once her mother hides the knives, gets her hair cut for $5 at the local barbershop when she gets lice. Relocated in wagons and cars by foot, ticks and armpits and pubic hair, tall grasses, tall grasses. There are telephone poles that link the whole town to the city, to the country. A country grows out of their backs and she has never known the reserve. Permits to leave, her grandmother married on Broken Head First Nation at 13, children after child after children, herself like fresh flint never struck. Great-great-grandma tilled fields, grew carrots, dreamed of owning territory, ownership, owning. Her sons went to war, and one came back blind. He dug his hands into the earth, Peguis First Nation, and breathed it in until he choked, until the earth filled his lungs, until grasses grew out of him. This next poem is called Love Letter to Southern Authority. Southern Authority is the authority that of uh, CFS, Child and Family Services, that I was under. Southern Authority means no father, no mother, means nobody. A permanent ward, fauna in the background, a deer, a moose, myself. I stand at the door of a new home and don't knock. Beyond it are fields to graze in, trees to rub my soft flesh against, shake off the flies. I don't know what exists inside it. I don't know what exists inside, the bones of, the, of it slimy and white like teeth, the foundation growing in concrete like skin over a burn. The doorknob blisters when I grab it. I choose to walk away, hands at my sides, afraid to touch even a crocus. Everything I grasp recoils, transforms. Every novelty is terrifying and I am still so young. Birds fly towards me, circle and dive. They pluck out my old eyes and replace them with birch bark. I live for a hundred years like this. No one can tell the difference. This po uh, poem is called God, lowercase g. 
which I don't know why I said that because it's the very first line of the goddamn poem, but oh well. God. God is a lowercase g. Grandma at the wood stove cooking hash browns. The whiskey in her tea covered by a paper towel as if she thinks I can't smell the metallic head of it on her breath. A hammer when she can Okay, I'm going to start that again. I don't know how to edit this, so I'm just going to do it again. <laughs> God is a lowercase g. Grandma at the wood stove cooking hash browns, the whiskey in her tea covered by a paper towel, as if she thinks I can't smell the metallic head of on her breath, a hammer when she kisses me. I am not upset. God wouldn't judge. This God I made from paper mache in kindergarten class. This God has six eyes, a rotten potato, potato misshapen and old as, a, as if aging in reverse. I use the water to form him, drink a bit of it even though I'm not supposed to. I get sick and curse God, decide to break him with my hands, stuffing fingers in his eyes. God will never be, was never a child like me, fully formed and then not. I eat hash browns and dirt cakes my feet, use the outhouse and get a splinter. The red vinyl floor is cracked in two, dirt erupting from the cold ground apart like the sea. I try to find God in the spaces where he is not, the empty places, the doghouse, the cupboard under the wash basin. I lost him in the trash with the empty bottles of whiskey, the tea bags, the bones of fish. And this is the last poem I'll read. Thank you so much for tuning in, or however this is going to be disseminated. Um, thank you for bearing with my rough readings tonight. I have never spoken to my computer like this before, since I was maybe 16, <laughs> alone in my apartment, uh, making like silly vlogs for myself. So. This is an experiment for everybody. This next poem is called Two Indians Walk Into a Bar. They met at a bar like Indians do, drunk on cheap, cheap beer and cheaper talk, never understanding how remarkable it was they survived to that moment. I pretend they whispered to each other, oh, where you've been all my life, an impossibility. I was born and they fought, a crust into, into walls, both unable to speak with their mouths full of water. I cried, and when my dad left, my mom cut up his clothes, broke his glasses, gave him a kiss. Love is like a hand gripping a cold beer, lightly until someone tries to take it. My dad once told me he shot his horse, her leg broken, and she fought every minute at the barrel of his gun. Thank you again. <laughs> uh, I hope you have the, a good quarantine um, as best you can. And thanks for tuning in. Bye. Oh, hey everybody, um, I just was sleeping and <clears throat> I was really just thinking about what's going on right now and in my slumber and I kind of prepared a few words that I thought we could all learn or a two, a thing or two, sorry, just woke up a thing or two about, um, so if you'll hear me in this time, uh, I just wanted to share this. In these uncertain times, McDonald's is here to, to deliver a familiar, comforting, and delicious experience you can count on, no matter where you are. Even though some dining areas may be closed, most McDonald's restaurants are still open, and serving serving our, customer, our customers through such options as uh, drive through carry out, and make delivery. From March 24th to April 6th, make delivery through both Uber Eats and DoorDash is offering $0 delivery fee for any orders with a minimum $15 basket size. Learn more how McDonald's is supporting. Up next is Mallory Tater. Mallory is a poet and fiction writer living in Vancouver with her husband and fellow writer, Curtis LeBlanc. Her collection of poetry, This Will Be Good, was published in 2018 with Book Hug Press, and her debut novel, The Birthyard, was released with HarperCollins Canada and Audible earlier this month. She's the publisher of Rahilo's Ghost, a local press publishing limited edition poetry chapbooks like Brandy's, and she teaches creative writing at the University of Victoria and the University of British Columbia. Here's Mallory. Oh, hey, didn't see you there. 
Thanks for having me at Fine Coal. I'm recording uh, from my lovely courtyard, social distance. Uh, thank you to Curtis, my husband, fellow writer and cameraman. Um, and I'm going to be reading from The Birthyard today, which is my forthcoming, not sorry, I'm so used to saying it's forthcoming. It came out March 3rd with HarperCollins Canada. You can buy it from your local indie bookstores like Massey Books, who's actually able to deliver to your house during this time. Um, and hopefully one of these days, uh, I'll be able to go in and look at it on the shelves again because it's my first novel and that was really exciting. Okay. I'm going to read a part from chapter one that's just petering off into chapter two. What you need to know is that my protagonist, Sable, is in a cult, a cult where she's going to be forced to have sex when she's 18 to repopulate the den, which is what the cult is called. So when she gets pregnant later on, the girls will be sent to this birth yard where they're forced to microdose on drugs to make them more docile. Um, and I actually did research on this, and this is a real drug called Devil's Breath. It has a more clinical name that I can't remember off the top of my head. But it's a drug in South America that when taken can actually kind of put somebody into a zombified, um, um, impressionable state where um, you kind of, you, you lose your free thought. So that's the idea of what, and in the book I call them docigens, to be docile. Graham Evelyn told me docigens are called devil's breath in mainstream. They're sometimes used to rape and control women, to zombify them with dangerously high doses. When Lynx brought the drug back to the den, he forced all women to begin taking it. It seemed to work. Graham Evelyn was a teenage girl. She said she made herself vomit and would not swallow them. She was too afraid. But when my mother received hers for the first time at her birth yard, she loved them became addicted to the numbing effect they had. But sex? Sex mystifies me. I've never tried to be with a boy. Neither have Dina or Mamie, though Dina came close. She held a boy named Jonathan sex in her mouth one night, then spat it out when white semen filled her mouth. She talked forever about the salt of it every time we'd eat potatoes at lessons. Way saltier than these, she'd crunch at us. My match will be my first, I say. My gram's cheeks redden and she fiddles with a crease in the fabric of her dress over her breast. Her dress is pilling. It doesn't look new. You're a good girl, Sable. You're ready. My mother leaves to slice up the rolls so we can fill our stomachs before dinner. My mother always eats a pre-dinner before my father comes home. At dinner, she'll touch a few spinach leaves soaked in oil. She'll fork mushrooms dripping in gravy and wash them down with a cup of lemon water. But the bread, the heaviness, the potatoes or salted things, she doesn't touch under my father's gaze, even though I know he wouldn't say anything about her widened figure or anything rude to hurt her. What is it with women and bread? Our fear of it. I find myself doing the same as my mother. I scrape most of the frosting off my cake and bread as the years go on, spooned it onto my sister's plate until she grew older and also refused to consume it. Suppose we aren't supposed to feel full, satisfied, too comfortable, or we'll get emotional, confident, unbridled in conversation and tone, but maybe being hungry throughout the day is its own challenge. I do, I do not blame my mother for giving in, for wanting more fuel, more salt, and more joy. My mother comes back with sliced rolls and garlic butter and knives and napkins. It looks so good. We eat and do not discuss sex anymore. My mother dips her problems away, licks butter off her wrist and thumb, I want to tell her that I've already counted the flowers on all the sets of curtains on each window, that I've already eaten my fill of rolls and had enough tea, that I'm bored of food and flavor, that all I want is to take notes in history lessons, listening to the lecture talk of mainstream, why we left to better our values. I want to learn about mainstream music and vehicles, wars, celebrities. We're supposed to learn that mainstream's bad. My secret longing and curiosity about it is something I would never share. I want to learn why men hate other men so much they kill, why people believe in higher powers when all they get is this soul life, why they think that our genders should fill the same roles, not the ones we are made for, and why others don't follow Lynx's teachings or even know of them. I feel sorry for what they miss. They miss order, the family body, hysteric restraint built into their routines. They have to make all these elaborate risky choices, whom to wed, whom to believe in, 
what to believe, what to become, how to earn a living, how to do everything, and how to do it alone. Sometimes I have insomnia. I pretend I have such choices, and I fall asleep out of exhaustion and stress. Is that stress worth it? Why is mainstream so keen on choice? I'd love to know. I'd also fear to know. I want to talk to Graham Evelyn about her oldest stories of Lynx and Iris and universities and ask and share and write it all down. I want to learn the history of birthyards and the history of our bodies, but I will only ever be taught of my own small, insufficient body. Thank you. In these uncertain times, McDonald's is here to deliver. In these uncertain times, McDonald's is here to deliver a familiar here to deliver a familiar comforting and delicious no matter where you can tell. Even though some dining areas, even though some dining most McDonald's restaurants are still in these uncertain times, McDonald's is here to deliver a familiar comforting and delicious comforting time. McDonald's is here to deliver Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's far too kind. Can I get an encore? Do you want more? Cook it raw with the Brooklyn boys on the one last time. I need y'all to Now what the hell are you waiting for? After me, there should be no more. So Times. McDonald's is here to deliver a familiar, comforting, and delicious experience you can count on. Wanna start this over again. And our final performers are Teresa with their song Sappho's Apple.
Okay, that is it. That is the end of the show. Thanks again to Nathan, Brandy, Mallory, Teresa, you for tuning in, and all the frontline workers, the doctors, nurses, grocery clerks, custodial staff, delivery drivers. We appreciate you. All right. Thanks again. Take care.